game of the conference. Spring and muttering. Maximize the power of our creative imagination using <laughs> Was that the theme? It was, wasn't it? Excellent. Well Round of applause. Right. So who's got where where's our first question? We've got a few minutes to tap these big brains. These brains are the size of a local gas giant. <laughs> Jupiter-sized brains. Who wants to tap them? Yes, sir. Oh, I'm, I'm sure you do. You, 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 you kind of you twitched. Have you got have you got something something on your mind, or even a statement? Not at the moment. There's a hand. There's a hand yeah. You waited till I got on that side. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fire away. Uh, my name is Kwame. Uh, my question is, uh, let's say you're in a head of engineering uh, and you have, okay, let's say you have, you're like head of engineering and you have about 10 to 15 people uh, underneath you. Um, how would you say would be the best way to like structure your team uh, so that they can become much more efficient? Is that your situation? Out of curiosity, yes. Yeah. I don't have an answer. I was just curious if that was. Uh... Can, we, can we just get the question yeah. repeated, just so we yeah. got because the audio was a little bit. I was just saying, how would you structure like a team of fifteen engineers to get the best output out of them? Like, yeah. would you break them down into like you know team of fives or like yeah? So... Just want to see. I think sadly the 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 obvious usual answer is well it depends and it depends on what you're trying to accomplish so what are you trying to do and you would focus on setting up the team to succeed right so so I actually did experience this very early on in my career and I talked about some of it in my talk yesterday and I did inherit a team of seven, which very quickly became a team of 15, actually. Um, but they all had different roles and responsibilities. So I ended up creating a department in the end, which basically had a development team. So there was guys writing the software. There was um, a program sort of office team, program managers, product managers, project managers. There was a design team. We did a lot of design product work user experience stuff. So there was a team of them and there was the ops guys who basically managed all the products and services that were built and put into production. But then that worked based on what our context was and what my responsibilities were and what my department's responsibilities were and how we served the business. So how you set it up will depend on what you're trying to achieve, but also you should be having a conversation with the team about that, getting their input getting their thoughts on how do they think they can best work as long as you're clear about the goals, what your vision is, what your strategy is. And like I said, what are you trying to accomplish? What then, outcomes are you aiming for? And how are you going to measure that? And then iterate, Seth. And then once you try it, know you'll get it wrong. Yeah. That your first attempt is the moment when you know the least about how to do this as you ever will and be prepared to change it and make it easy. I, I, Does that help? I, I would agree with that. I think the understanding of what objectives your teams have been charged with doing would be the starting point. And then how many work streams need to be part of achieving those strategic objectives. And then you look at the skill sets, the skills mix that would be required to deliver each of those work streams. And that determines the composition of your teams. Right. So without knowing what you're trying to achieve, what, you know, work streams you would be responsible for, it would be hard. But if you follow that principle, um, you would be able to structure your team. Accord Have you ever heard of dynamic reteaming? Hannah, um, 
Hannah, Heidi, Heidi uh, Halfend, uh, actually, she did a, I was at the conference where she introduced the idea in like a lightning talk, it was brilliant, um, has since written a book about how you, how you can think about creating teams and recreating them. So check it out. Dynamic reteaming. So uh, I'm, I'm curious, can you tell us what type of engineering um, your team does? What, what, what are you producing? What's your product? Kwame. He's Googling. Oh, no, we, we're just, we just building like CRM for SaaS, you know, or SaaS based company. So it's building a CRM for, for um, our customer base. Uh, and so we have people handle product. Um, and then we had, you know, the actual engineering team, which is like front end engineering, back end engineering. Uh, and so a lot of times we just want to try to find a way to efficiently break the teams down so that we can get the, the um, more efficiency and more output out of them. Uh, so that we can iterate faster because a lot of times it's like, you know, as you grow, you tend to begin to slow down <laughs> in, in, in how you, you deploy. And that's a great point that when you grow initially, you do slow down, don't you? Yeah. I was just going to just say, just adding to that, that the, the other thing, I want to everything that all the panelists have said is try to keep the structure as flat as possible, right? So we've spent the last two days talking about hierarchy, right? So I think trying to keep your team structure flat is in your interests. And the other book, so the, the book recommendation that was made, another one that might be worth looking at is looking at the team topology stuff. Yeah, It's a lot of excellent stuff there, how to focus on what you're trying to do, roles, and how to set yourselves up for success. So we're both good book recommendations. You learn so much by looking at this stuff. I've also got a, a recording that one of the authors of that book did at the meetup that I organized. So you can find that on YouTube. So you come talk to me after and we can sort that out. Fantastic. Coming, sir. Thank you very much. I wasn't in. Mr. Money's uh, breakout session, but I'm in the telecommunication sector and I want to put my question in front of the panel. So my question is, how do you deal with uh, governmental regulatory bottlenecks in your drive to churn out fares to the market, products and services in order to beat competition? How can we utilize the power of our creative imagination in order to achieve it in the light of the regulatory environment that one finds himself. So the question, how do we be agile in a highly regulated environment? I think so. Yeah. Um, in heavily regulated organizations, what happens is that you have to comply you know, there's an element of compliance as well as there's an element of delivery. So, you know, regardless of whether you're in the aut automotive, you're, you're in the banking, the health sector, there are regulatory bodies that have their own requirements, but they have fixed timelines. So you can deliver much of that stuff by planning using waterfall methods. Um, it's really about applying agile where it needs to be applied where there is a degree of uncertainty, where there is, you know, a need for multidisciplinary input and, you know, where there is a need to bring together a know-how to, to, to craft a way through something that is untraveled. That's where, you know, uh, you know, frameworks like Scrum are best suited. So it's really about targeting the solution to the element of you know, whatever initiative that you're doing. So waterfall for compliance, um, but then applying agile to where, you know, you know, you can apply it to marketing as well. You can apply it to HR because there are elements of the HR process that requ require, you know, some cooperation and collaboration. So that's, that's what I would say 
um, is about being pragmatic in whatever sector is important to be pragmatic. Yes. So um, the thing is that with regards to regulations, because almost everywhere you work, you would get regulations. But then when you have these stair codes and they have the dates, <laughs> most of the time these dates don't change. They're the same year on year. The requirements hardly change. They're the same year on year. So the thing is, if you know the dates and you know the requirements, if you plan ahead, you break up, you know, if you have, if you have to get 10 deliverables, let's say, and every cycle or sprint or whatever you want to call it, you do the first one followed by the second, the third, by the time the date comes, you have the 10 achieved. That's agile in its own right. The thing is that sometimes we as human beings make these things so complex because we work in environments where people feel like when it's complex, then it looks like they're doing work. Same way you go somewhere and people start throwing jargons, the HRQ of the dot, dot, dot version one of that. Let's break all the BS and let's take it for what it is, trip it to the, the, the minimum thing. What do you need to do to deliver this at what date? Plan backwards. If you've done it so many times, you know in your sleep what's going to happen. I was working with an automobile company and we had um, something that we had to deliver. And, you know, whilst the senior managers were panicking, the guys working on it were like, don't worry, on so-so date, somebody will say that they can't do it. And then they'll ship it another three months that that would happen for six or seven months before we deliver. So people doing the job, they know exactly what they need to do there to get to that part. So plan the path and then make sure that at every point you decide to check in, you have five deliverables that you plan to achieve at that time. And by the time you know it, you've got in there. Thank you. I think while Louisa was saying that, what came to my mind is that there are so many different agile frameworks and I completely forgot about Kanban for some yeah. reason. Right. So, <laughs> which, exactly. So Kanban is excellent, really. I mean, it's end of the day, right? It's right there. It's right there. So, you know, just having that product backlog and, and, and setting those whip limits of what each team can, can achieve and, and planning, as Louisa said at the very beginning, um, enables you to take a stepwise approach and, uh, and deliver in a sustainable way. So there are a whole raft of agile techniques that you can apply. And Kanban is very good in a business as usual um, type environment, even for compliance projects is what I would say. So it's applying the, uh, you know, uh, framework that will work best in that situation. Do you want to say something? I think you have mostly covered it. I think the only thing I would add is there's a couple of things. So compliance, like lots of other things, doesn't sit standalone, right? It sits as part of other things. And these regulatory requirements are always going to be there, right? In my environment, they exist. But I do think they change. I don't think they're standard. Most things continue to evolve and change based on market forces. So the only thing I have sometimes seen done, and I've tried to do it myself in the past, is I've heard a lot of people talking about things like acceptance criteria, definition of done. McCall did a great job of outlining his constraints and things for the the, the building the paper airplanes workshop that he did. But you could build these into your stories. You could build them into your backlog. And, you know, as my fellow panelists have said, you should be forward planning, but you should have items on your backlog, which will probably have that focus. And you might likely also have sprints where the goal and the focus will be any actual compliance activities that you've got because those deadlines are looming. So it's a different way to just approach the problem. I, I talked at the end of my talk about, I think we spend too much time thinking about challenges we should be thinking about where are the opportunities? Where is the opportunity to think differently and approach a problem in a different way? Yeah. 
It's either a, it's either, is, is, it, is it either a challenge or an opportunity? Or is it choose it, to see it, right? Just an opportunity. Yeah. Not bad. Okay, um, my question is this. Um, what if you find yourself in an organization where you are producing and you have staff with a wide range of educational background? You're trying to introduce agility. You also want to say that, it, not that you want to say, your survival depends on the creativity and innovation of your staff because um, the industry is dynamic. Now, there is cost associated with failure. And in all the discussions today, we've said that failure is acceptable. How do you draw the line between accepting failure for growth or people taking advantage of the fact that failure is acceptable and so they would want to take you for the ride? Uh, yeah, so um, I think there's a misconception here. When we say failure is acceptable, we are not saying that means we could go, We should go and say today we'll fail, tomorrow we'll fail, and anytime we go, we'll go, whoop, whoop, we failed. That's not what we're saying, okay? What we're trying to say, and the reason why we say failure is a good thing is because of the lesson that you will learn out of it. If you start something you don't know and you expect that on the first try, you'll get it 100%, then I don't know, stop taking the mushrooms. But anyways, what I'm trying to drive at is whatever happens, there would be some aspects that you wouldn't get correct. That gives you an opportunity to sit back and check. Where did we go wrong? Why did we go wrong? Next time we're doing this, what aspects do we need to take out of this so that the deliverable we get when we take it to market is something that is innovative enough for our clients to always want to come back to us? That's what we're trying to say. You know, your question was so long, I've forgotten everything else other than that. <laughs> Yes. Uh, may I also just add, um, I think perhaps the the idea that failure is acceptable gets overemphasized because it is so often viewed as an absolute uh, an absolute negative. We're trying to reframe it. I think this toward action as opposed to analysis paralysis and being so afraid to try that we never get started, right? So that phrase, stop, start, and start finishing, these things start to come together. What we're pushing back against is to fail to act out of fear of failure. It is not to say that failure is ever the goal uh, or not to be feared or, or that it has no cost, but rather that there is also a cost. But what the, the, the phrase, not, not is a choice, but the thing you choose is failure. So don't do there. Don't live there. Live in trying something and getting it wrong and trying again. You're better off the spot. And the other thing that I would add is that uh, one of the reasons why this came about, this being safe to fail, it was to encourage creativity, right? And innovation. And the thing about innovation is that it's an untraveled road right and if people are afraid that they're going to lose their job if things don't work out they're not going to be creative right but one of the ways to minimize the risk is to design experiments where it is safe to fail right you just take a small part of that 
initiative that is really doesn't cost, you know, the cost impact isn't so huge that you can learn a little bit. And once you know a little bit more, then you, 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 you know, you take a bigger bet, right? So safe to fail experiments will help in that situation. Do you get me? I see you nodding. So I think you're happy, right? I, I think you wanted to say something. I, I think he's, again, I think he's mostly covered it. I think the, the, the stance that most of us try to recommend and coach in coaching in teams and organizations is you want to become a learning organization. Yes. I, I, and, and failure is learning, right? But as everyone said, we don't want to find ourselves in situations where it's like, yeah, yeah, we screwed up, we messed up, we fail, happy days, high fives, right? Because that doesn't make much sense. No one goes out to fail. But should you fail or not achieve what you set out to achieve, you must simply focus on what you learned from that so the next time you you can do better. And all of this is about being informed. If you think of the exercise we've just done um, with the, the cards, once we had some data, you had something to use to make a more informed decision. Failure is the same thing. It's, again, how you choose to use it and apply it to become better at what you're doing. And as agile practitioners and leaders, we should always be about continuous improvement and creating a culture where we do feel like it's safe to do little manageable experiments. And when we do experiments, we de-risk. And it's we don't squander lots of budget. We actually learn quickly. And everybody benefits from that. But failure is built into that but as a learning opportunity. Do any of you want to speak to the idea of highly skilled team? That was part of the question too. Highly skilled. Yeah. I don't want to overburden the question, but I think part of the question was also about different levels of skill on the team. This is another common question in Agile that I think we could probably speak to. Louisa, do you want to? Um, I'll give you, I'll tell you a story. Um, they've been very public about it. 3M has a division in their organization called HIS, the Health Information Services Group. They have liberal doctors, MDs, that must be involved in the development process. Um, a mutual friend of ours actually worked on that project. Um, literal beyond the, they can't afford to put a doctor with an MD on all of these teams. And so strategies are to, to deal with that issue. In their case, they had a team of doctors that spent most of their time educating the other teams about what it was that they did in that function. It was not, 100% of their day was not spent leveraging their medical degree. A very small that they did required their medical degree to, to, to function. In fact, most of it was regulatory. They had to have certain boxes checked that a doctor looked at it and verified it. Everything else was teachable. Everything else was teachable. I didn't try anymore to write any code. Oh, did we lose someone? Can, is there anything coming? When we're on a that hands-on keyboard is get him a cup of coffee can focus on getting that thing out the door, then I'm supporting that effort. And sometimes that's what I do. They don't need that part. And, and then just to add to that as well, um, if you have varying strengths or experiences, try to um, pair, pair someone who's least experienced with someone who's highly skilled so that there's knowledge transfer. In so doing, you upskill those that don't know too much to a certain level so that the whole team will get to a point where the knowledge is passed and shared on. That's very important. I think that maybe would help you. That was wow. How are you feeling? So, you know, you know, we're in Ghana. We're we're in we're in the continent. Sorry, sorry, card. <clears throat> 
There is a tradition at Akaditi conferences that was started by the, f- the first presenter, whose name was Scrum Daddy. Uh, Scrum Daddy. Now, I am not going by that moniker at all. I am my own daddy. <laughs> so, but what Scrum Daddy used to say is, how are you feeling? And the response was agile. So it then changed. It then changed to put an African accent on it. So it then went, how are you feeling? And the response was, agile. So we're going to continue progressing and we're going to have to change it again soon. But as this is the first conference back, I'm going to ask you how you're feeling. And I hope the response is, agile. Are we ready? We might get both. How are we feeling? Let's try that one more time. How are we feeling? All right. That's that's enough nonsense. So I'd like to thank our incredible panel who've come up and answered your bewilderingly difficult questions again. Um, and I, I, I mean, look at them, <laughs> just shattered, <laughs> glazed looks on their faces. And these are hardcore professionals. So um, I'd really like you to give it up for our panel, for McCall, for Addy, for Lisa, and for Satpal. Give it up. Come on, let's give it up. Thanks, guys. You can, you, you are relieved. <laughs>